Hello everyone. Today, for the first time ever, I have a very special guest, someone you never met on my channel, but I'm sure some of you have came across um, through many other avenues, not just on YouTube. This is a very special guest, uh, Mr. Stuart Pierce, all the way from United Kingdom, one of my favorite places on earth. <laughs> Welcome, 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 Stuart. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. And um, I would introduce Stuart partially because Stuart is such a beautifully complex spiritual being that I know that as we live life, there is more and more to add to his um, introduction. So mm -hmm. Stuart Pierce is a master of voice and corporate presentation coach who finds and liberates the authentic power and presence in the world's most extraordinary people. And those people actually included Margaret Thatcher and Princess Diana. So Stuart, please, what is the most important in description of yourself? What can you add to that? Well, the most important description of who I am is that I'm a spiritual seeker. That's who I am. Um, for the whole of my life, I've been aware of the multidimensional universe. Um, so I was very aware as a child. Obviously, that awareness was interrupted by education and the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, as Shakespeare would have it. Um, so I found a way of living as a 3D person, but, uh, you know, fortunately, I've now reached a point of maturity where my pedigree allows me to um, travel the world when COVID is not around and to live the fullness of what I do, which is really to tune people into their notes. We each have a note. We each have a signature sound, which is our bio identity and the song of our soul. So I tune people into their notes. And of course, that, that, you know, that can be either in the public domain, working with actors or um, public, you know, pu public personalities who have to make speeches on stages or presentations and are feeling, as we all do, somewhat nervous about moving into public presentation. You know, even the ones that make it look so simple are also very nervous and anxious like we all are, because fundamentally we want to be the complete being that we are. And when we're standing in front of a large group of people, sometimes authenticity is difficult to hold on to because of the demand that they're putting upon us. Whereas in a healing context, I have great fun in the adventure of healing. I believe healing is a movement back to wholeness. And so I help people find their note and therefore find the song of their soul, find harmony within and therefore address their own specific sovereignty. Beautifully said. I really appreciate this, Stuart. So the question just occurred to me, which I didn't have before. And this is how usually it goes when I connect with people like yourself the spirit communicates. Um, do you think that the frequency that we are born with, as you said, we all carry the frequency. Do you think this frequency remains at the core the same or it changes quite a lot as we evolve on the spiritual journey? Well, everything is evolution. I mean, we are, we are from the source and the source is an infinitely unfolding creative possibility full of love and joy. So we're here, part of an infinitely unfolding creative possibility. Therefore, our purpose is to optimize our creativity full of love and joy. And I believe that we're all waking up to that there's no such thing as permanency. The establishment has tried to introduce us to permanency in order to make us feel safe and secure. And yet at the moment, when we look into the social organisms of central government, central banking and the corporate world, we don't feel safe or secure. So we're constantly evolving. Therefore, the resonance of our voices is constantly, constantly uh, evolving. But our own particular frequency doesn't change. It's just the, you know, if we see the frequency as a lens through which the light shines, to begin with, it's very, it's very small and very gentle in the innocence of our beings. Of course, all of this information we have at birth, our spiritual toolkit is within us. The challenge always is, um, does the 3D world allow us 
to really live the fullness of our spiritual toolkit. And as we see in many organizations that we move through, through education, through politics, and through the employment zone, that often our essential belief in self is altered by strong co coercion or strong um, prejudice or rules and regulations from the outside. What's happening right now, I believe, as we record in, in late July 2021, is that we're, we're all waking up to our own sovereignty. And so we're unplugging from systems that no longer feed us, and we're beginning to create our own systems in the, the effect of creating a new hierarchy of values. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we evolve all the time, but our frequency is the same. You know, there's something very extraordinary about sound creating um, or rather, let me rephrase, that the whole of creation is based on the principle of sound. So we can go into indigenous tribes, people, we can go into civilized society, so-called civilized society, and find the same thing. The Big Bang, not the big silence, created it all 13.7 billion years ago. And so <clears throat> as we go into the firmament of sound, we can really begin to feel how to develop our own sovereignty, because once we find our own note, we find harmony, and thence we feel the I am presence working through us. Thank you, beautifully said, Stuart, again. I really appreciate this. Tell me now your book, your latest book, Diana, The Voice of Change, which, by the way, I just want to mention here is available at this moment on Amazon and ebook, paperback, and it's also on audio. So you can listen to the book and Stuart is the narrator. So he's reading the book, which I think no one else could really read it because <laughs> that's the best. Yes, it would be a little bit absurd, wouldn't it? Unless somebody like Ben Cumberbatch, you know, or, you know, one of those great actors that I've worked with. <laughs> but no, it seemed a little bit silly that, you know, I'm regarded to be this voice specialist. Yes. But I, I hadn't recorded it. But Stuart, my, my questions, I have so many questions regarding uh, Princess Diana. I have to tell you, first of all, how I even decided to connect with you. Um, throughout my life, I always followed my intuition. And this voice within me, I actually wrote the entire book about this to myself. This voice within me guides me through life and I tend to listen more and more and lately I was on YouTube and your video showed up on the site as the um, suggestion. So I click on it and the voice told me, you have to talk to this man. And I haven't heard about you prior. So I went into your channel. By the way, Stewart's channel is Stuart Pierce. All the links will be below for everyone to check. And I listened to certain uh, conversations you had, also your meditations that you have, and you have a lot of spiritual programs as well, so people can um, look into that as well. But I understood why the voice told me to connect with you, and this is because of Diana. Um, I, again, be very honest, because I was never this type of person. I'm originally from Poland. I happen to live in the US, but I never had this sense of like obsession with Diana or um, you know, some people are like on the brink of fanatism, of adoration. I always acknowledged her, but I never had this like um, obsession, okay? I knew she is incredibly special and there was something very unique about her. I felt this, but I think I wasn't ready in that time as I am now to, to know more. And my first question to you is about her because you had an absolute blessing to be working with her for two years um, of, of your lives. Do you think, what was actually the turning point, Stuart, that brought her to you, that she decided to find her voice? Diana was a seeker. And so all, all through her royal career, largely as a result of her presence meeting up against great criticism and oppression and denial of her, that she'd sought out help through psychiatrists, through psychologists, 
And also she had moved into the field of alternative healing, which during the 80s was really beginning to take off. Um, and so Diana grew and grew and grew. And of course, we can see that she moved from being um, a rather plain young woman into a really beautiful, exquisite being. And this was through the dint of her own purpose, because she was becoming aware of her consciousness, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, it was very alive within her body, it was very alive within her sensory being, and within her sensuality. So she swam once a day, 20 lengths at least, and often, you know, four times, five times a week would go to the gym to work out. So she was very aware of her physical strength. And she realized that she wasn't breathing as fully as she could. And that the sound that she was making, the voice that she was using, was the voice of submission. And when she, when she saw herself in the Martin Bashir mm -hmm. program, the Panorama program, she was, very, um, she was very pleased about the points of revelation that she made, the voice of liberation but she was not pleased with the way that she looked, that she did this. And she sort of spoke in this little voice rather like this, um, which is above the breath rather than being in the breath. And so she spoke with a very dear friend of hers who was a confidant, who happened to be a leading patroness of me, uh, uh, of my work. Um, uh, this was a wonderful woman who alas is now dead called Mara Burney who was very much a go-to confidant for a number of people, particularly Diana. And so Mara said to Diana, I think you need to meet Stuart because I think Stuart will really help you. And Diana said, yes, I think I've heard his name before. Anyway, so Mara organized the meeting. So it was really that that precipitated, it was the panorama interview that precipitated her into okay. discovering more about herself. And of course, as soon as we began our first two conversations, our first two sessions, mm -hmm. she began to realize that there was a tremendous amount that I could offer her. Beautiful. Stuart, so let me ask you how you have changed you through those two years, how, how you transformed because of that soul agreement two of you had? Oh, it was just extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. I felt that I'd arrived in an expression of my spirit with a leading person because you know obviously i'd worked with leading people before but this was the first time where my spirit was not compromised where i i didn't need to closet yeah. but you know you don't walk into downing street saying hi i see angels you know <laughs> <laughs> but on this occasion you know Dennis said, ah, you see angels oh because because i had this extraordinary divine transmission in 1987 of meeting 12 angels that call themselves the Angels of Atlantis. And um, so I've been working with them for the last 34, 35 years. That was one of my questions, by the way, about them. About the angels, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, but with Diana, you see, Diana was the absolute embodiment of unconditional love. Oh, beautiful. And so there were no restrictions. There were no obstructions. Yeah. But Diana was completely open Beautiful. And of course, as we saw in the early part of her royal career, as an empath, she found that level of openness really difficult because she would sound her note of openness mm -hmm. into the family and it would be met by this jarring, you can't do that, you must do this, you can't do it, etc, etc. And that terrified her. And as an empath in her hypersensitivity, she closed down mm -hmm. and her greatest friend was bulimia. Yeah. Yeah. It led, it led, and of course, co consequently, it led her to her freedom because she realized yeah. that she was wasting herself. She also cut herself, and she tried, you know, she cut cut her wrist and tried to um, tried to kill herself on two occasions wow. by throwing herself down the staircase. That's how, at her wit's end, she was. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, friends came around her and gathered her up and said, I think you really need to go and see this person. And so she began this process of self-empowerment from around 83 um, forward to the time that I met her, which was 95. So I was blessed to have the last two years of her life. Not that we knew that then, but um, it was just extraordinary because she had broken away from the royal family and she was very much her own mistress 
looking after herself and developing all of the charitable endeavors that she was engaging in. Um, and of course, that was when we recorded in the Chronicles of Time, some of the most extraordinary things that she did, for example, with landmines. Right, right. That picture, no one will ever forget her going through that landmine. Um, yeah. Stuart, you know, now as I feel my spirit has very strong resonance with, with Lady Diana, I perceive her as the example of absolutely Christ consciousness in mm -hmm. a form of a woman that was showing people again by the example how to how to overcome and how to keep the love in spite of everything else. So I want to ask you about this. I was wondering if you could describe her vibration to us um, as a color or as a sound in the nature, what would be the closest? Well, actually, her favorite color was pink. And I always saw this huge pink halo in her aura. And of course, pink is the, the color of cosmic love. So I knew that she was totally in touch with the ascended masters and mistresses. And, you know, there would be, because obviously she was a woman that was called, she was a human being that was called to a point of destiny to bring about vast change. Little did we know that the biggest change would be through her dying. And of course, I write about this very fully in the book, but her dying released a force of Shakti within the world where it is recorded that 3.5 billion people wept. And that was over half the population of the planet at that time. So yes, yeah, so I saw a tremendous amount of pink. You know, one of the greatest arousals that Diana had was when she connected with Mother Teresa and visited Mother Teresa. And in fact, the first time that she visited Mother Teresa, unfortunately, the meeting didn't take place because Mother Teresa was not well. She was very elderly and frail. And she'd been rushed to hospital in Italy from, um, from, um, from uh, Delhi or Mumbai. And um, Diana arrived to visit Mother Teresa to be told, well, actually yesterday she left to have surgery. But all of her sisters, all of Mother Teresa's sisters, took Diana into the chapel, the main chapel in the hospice, and sat her in the center of the circle. And they all sang to her the Ave Maria and the Lord's Prayer. And Diana said that it was the most extraordinary experience. Nobody else was permitted, just her with the sisters, because she felt the Holy Spirit come mm -hmm. into her. And in that moment, she knew the conviction of what her destiny would be. Wow. And, um, wow. you know, so that, in other words, that amplified, you, you, I feel your observation is absolutely correct, that the Christ light, the Christos yes. came yes. into her. Yes. And therefore, you know, more and more and more and more, she radiated this extraordinary power that was given to her from source. Stuart, you know, I ask you about the color, because on the cover of your book, that purple pinkish shade, is actually the aura, if you would ask me, and I never you know, saw her in that form, like you did, I would describe her color as, as that. Um, well, yes, yeah, so that's one of the reasons why I use the yeah. color, yes. because you know, talking about the pink that was here, and then it would move up into, into a lilac, or a very, very mm -hmm. light violet, mm -hmm. you know, which is always to do with the very, those higher dimensions of spirituality connecting into fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh dimension, yes. But obviously she was, she was so wonderfully vital in the physiology of her being, you know, as a spirit living as human, that she had many colors in her aura, but chiefly pink was the one that came forward. And she loved wearing pink clothes, you know, it was her favorite color. Yeah. Stuart, can you tell me, did she ever talk to you about how she saw her future? Did she ever mention this to you? Did she have oh, yes. any visions or? Yes. We talked a lot. We talked a lot about it. Yes, she was planning, interestingly, on moving to Malibu, or at least buying a house in Malibu. So it's very interesting that Harry, Harry and Meghan are, uh, you know, living in, in the, the hills there overlooking the Pacific, yeah. Montecito. Um, she she talked a tremendous amount about, I remember we were in New York 
in, I think it was at the beginning of 96. No, actually it was in the beginning of 97. We were in New York and, um, and several meetings took place where she was um, talking about certain interests that she had, charitable interests, that she wanted to make into documentaries and that the documentaries would become full, full scale movies. So she was planning a tremendous amount. She was an immensely creative and imaginative individual. So things were beginning to brew. You know, it's amazing because you mentioned the time frame that, as I know, because I actually happen to do a lot of research in certain topics and lately about Diana's um, certain meetings, right? Which again, how much can I know? But if you research, you can find quite a lot. Um, did she ever mention to you her friendship with JFK Jr? With? JFK Jr, with Jr. Because uh, they- John Kennedy. Yes, you know why I'm asking? Because you know this better than anyone really working with her. She was the most photographed woman in the history of humanity. And he was, in that time, at the same time, the most photographed and, and um, chased by paparazzi men in the world as well. And I know that they get to know each other and they became friends. I'm just curious because you are the person who really knew her. Did she ever talk to you about him? Only in passing, only, you know, he, he wasn't, they weren't terribly close. They had met, certainly, and um, they were also, we we weren't we were only just beginning to wake to internet communications at that point so she wrote a, she wrote copiously she was always sending cards and and uh, you know letters in correspondence so they were actually connecting with one another through letter i remember yeah wow beautiful and there was one particular birthday i think it was her night uh, her the 35th birthday which was the, in 95 and he sent her this huge bouquet of pink roses in 95 yeah wow i believe so i believe so well maybe it was a you know a dates i mix up <laughs> maybe it was earlier you know um i can't quite remember uh, and I, I i know little about jay kennedy um of course he's around a tremendous amount at the moment but they were both very powerful figures yes. in relation yes. to the dest yes. destiny of the world sure yes and what were Diana's spiritual practices that she was doing at the time when you worked with her? Well, she would meditate, or at least try to meditate once a day. And the use of prayer was something that she offered. All of this is in my book, Diana, the Voice of Change. Um, so they were the key, they were the key practices, but she was also very aware of remaining present in each moment, in each holy instant. Wow. And so therefore, being present, she tried to constantly choose the highest choice, which was for her one of love. Do as you would be done by, she would say, you know, lo love is all there is. So let's just keep hugging everybody. Beautiful. So, in that um, field of love that you enter in her presence, was there, what was the other feeling except this freedom of unconditional love? Is, was there any other feeling like you were having any sensation, um, you know, the vibration wise? Well, she was crystalline. And so everything about her shimmered with light. And you know the, the the light that seemed to flow around her, that was the main so source resource of her force, was this silver white light with, that would, that would then refract into different colors, as we were saying earlier. Um, this is what was so extraordinary about her. But as a human, the most specific thing was this extraordinary immediacy her authentic immediacy. So for example, if she met you mm -hmm. at a formal occasion, that if she if she felt called to it, the first thing she would say is, oh, I love your dress, where did you get it? I love that, or 
God, you're wearing amazing shoes. Where did you get those? You know, there was always this immense joy and ease. Diana was brilliantly funny. And so I remember we used to laugh and laugh and laugh. I mean, sometimes like children, we'd forget what we were laughing about. We were just giggling so much. You know, there was this extraordinary vibrancy about Diana. Of course, at the same time, on the other end of the spectrum, she was feeling very, very deeply as a hypersensitive and therefore would often become caught in very, very dark emotion. And if you like, it was my job to help her see a way of transmuting from the negative into positive, which she would do effortlessly. It's just that, you know, she she was cancer, meaning she was born under the sign of cancer. And with all cancer people, you know, <laughs> their feelings go deep, deep, deep into these big pools. What is your sign, Stuart? I'm a bull. I'm Taurus. You're Taurus. I'm a Capricorn. You're, you're also earthed in Capricorn. <laughs> um, but but I, I, according to a lot of astrologers, I have a very complex birth chart. So I have um, many, many planets in air and in fire. And you said, I actually wrote this down, I listening to your videos the other day. Um, two very important um, sentences that I agree, well, one is, um, one is the scientific and one is the statement. And you said that feeling is our superpower right now. And I agree with this immensely because as we create our reality is the feeling that is the fuel for the vision and intention is the emotion, is the feeling behind it. It's not just the thought alone, that is the sense of direction, but is the energy behind it, which is the feeling. And you, when you said it, it was such a great reminder that feeling is our superpower. And when we suppress those feelings, um, from my standpoint, I feel that's when we suppress that true voice within us. Absolutely, absolutely. You see, you know, going back to what we were saying earlier about our voices, mm -hmm. the interesting thing is that we've been educated, socialized and conditioned into a particular bandwidth, which is the, the cerebralization of comprehension. And so actually where most people go is they automatically go here. Yeah, I mean, I, and in the United States of America, it can be really, you know, right up there like this, you know, which has very little to do with my body. It has a lot to do with my cerebralization. But if we allow our voices to come back into our bodies, you know, if we really see that if, if words arise from the heart, they enter the heart. If words arise from the tongue alone, they don't pass beyond the ears, I quote Rumi, that we come right back into the very center of who we all are, that feeling is the language of the soul and that we're here to feel and create through feeling. In other words, we become distorted through the 3D complex of doing, 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 doing. We've been distorted by always leaning into comprehension rather than trying to find what our root is through compassion. These two extremes, comprehension and compassion. Yes. And, uh, and so and, you know, all, all of my work is about opening up the field of compassion. So it's returning to heart, which is where it is your true sound, your voice. And you said this, that the heart has the energy field that is 5,000 times greater than the one of the brain. And in this era of Aquarius that we already are in, this is the only way forward. And Stuart, before we end today, I have much more questions, but actually we still have a little time. So that's great. I want to ask you about that encounter you had with angelic beings. I feel like this is very important for you to say in this conversation. Well, um, in the in the late 70s, early 80s, I was really waking up to the potency of who I was. Um, as a child, uh, things had been very 
complex because I spoke about what I saw, thinking that everybody saw what I was seeing, was I was seeing angels, I was seeing fairies, I was seeing dead people, you know, et cetera, et cetera. My sixth sense was really very open. So I spoke about what I was seeing. And uh, my, my father worked for the um, British royal family. So we were brought up in, in royal palaces, you know, that are very old. <laughs> so there are many voices and many, many dead people walking around. <laughs> And so I spoke about what I was seeing and I, you know, I saw people look at me shocked, you know, and surprised. And my mother said, darling, I think we ought to, you know, just be careful about speaking about it. And I said, why? Why I want to speak about it? Because I've always been speaking. <laughs> um, and then of course, um, education interrupted mm -hmm. and I began to discover that I had profound difficulties mm -hmm. with learning. So I couldn't read because I was synesthetic, meaning I had a crossover of the senses. Yeah. So I could see sound, not just hear sound, but sea sound um, and the, the the reading process that I was um, led to was a very staccato the cat sat on the mat so I, I was completely confounded by this because after all all of the energy that I'd been supported by that I was living through was complete flow everything was in flow and the fact that I was actually having to cut things up into the moment I just couldn't do it um, and, and I was also profoundly numerically dyslexic. So if you can't read and you can't do math, then then it was post Second World War, what they did was beat you. So I just got beaten and beaten and beaten. Um, Lord, <laughs> because no. Apparently that was no. their way of beating intelligence into you. You're stupid beat. You are nothing. You will always be nothing. So I, I began to believe that I was nothing, except at the same time, I thought, I think I'm something. And then sometimes there would be people who would, in this environment of the educational world who would have all of this light around them and i would just go to the light so for example as i transited into high school um, in this bewildering state of not being able to read um, suddenly there was this person with so much light and she said to me there's something about your voice and when she said this the whole of the whole of her aura opened. So I've always gone to the light. I don't listen to the dark. I always go, I know what my darkness is. I just keep going to the light. And that was the beginning. And then that grew, you know, in, I, 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 somebody said, why don't you join the drama group? So I joined the drama group and suddenly said, there's something about your voice. You know, you really ought to become an actor. So I thought, well, that's the simplest thing to do. So I became an actor. And they said, there's something about your voice. There's something about your voice. So through the seventies, I worked as an an actor and then there was a genuine I won't go into the story now but there was a huge turning point where I was about to make a movie in Hollywood uh, because I was living in the states at that time and my brother telephoned me saying you need to know mum's got terminal cancer she had three months to live so I let the movie go came back to the United Kingdom nursed her for a year and then she passed and that was a huge turning point for me a big rite of passage for obvious reasons but it was just after her dying that a very remarkable voice teacher came to me who I'd worked with at the Royal Shakespeare Company um, who alas it's now dead but she was a leading voice director in the English speaking theatre world and she said well what are you doing and I said well I'm not doing anything I'm just being this because I was looking after the, the the whole substance of my mother's property our father had died three years prior so it was all very dramatic yeah. and so she said well why don't you stop that and come and teach for me there's something about your voice and there's this woman i want you to go and work with i don't want to work with her she's i'm a die-hard socialist and she's just taken over the conservative party so two weeks later then i was walking into downing street <laughs> a baptism by fire and margaret was wonderful absolute margaret thatcher was absolutely wonderful full of grace full of great humor and really wanting to learn so i just listened to her and then found ways of being able to inculcate all that I'd learned at Stratford at the Royal Shakespeare Company into her work as a politician. And we worked together about six months off and on, not every week, but you know, on occasion when she needed it. So I've always gone to the light, you know, and, and there I was developing up when my mother died, yes, and all of this took place, my psyche opened. Mm -hmm. And there I was seeing spirit once again, which I really switched off from. So I started developing it here in the city of London because somebody said to me, you really ought to go to the College of Psychic Studies. So I went to the College of Psychic Studies. You did. Actually, I heard of this place. Wow. Yeah. 
okay. and, and attended workshops and people were saying, you're a medium, you're a medium. And I thought, oh gosh, this is all too much. So I, I, I started reading for people. And so when people came to me for voice sessions, often the voice is impaired as a result of our emotional body being clouded or polluted by certain things that have happened in our lives. And often the dear ones would step in in spirit. So I would say, well, your mother's here talking to me. And uh, they would say, what do you mean your mo my mother's here talking to you? <laughs> well, your mother's saying, and they would say, how did you know that? So I developed my psyche. And then in 1987, a friend of mine had just opened a small crystal store, a store selling crystals in Glastonbury, yeah. which is the heart, heart chakra of the world in, in this, on this island, um, you know, where there is a high hill known as the Tor. And so he said, why don't you come and give readings for people? Because everybody's going to arrive. And I thought, well, this is fun. So I went to read. And during the, during the morning, I read for people half hour readings. And then I felt really tired. And by this time, I'd gone to India, where teachers of mine in India had said to me, when you feel, when you feel you're not in connection, go and meditate. So I went up onto the tour and I meditated. And as I meditated on this particular day, August 16th, 1987, I heard these extraordinary sounds. And I opened my eyes and there were these huge orbs, 12 huge orbs. And I heard one of them say, we are the angels of Atlantis, and we're going to give you a temple of sound healing, which you will call the alchemy of voice. Wow. And a light penetrated through me. I thought I was having a heart attack. It was so huge. So I dropped to the floor and then recovered. And then I heard them speak. We are going to be working with you over the next 12 years, preparing you to hold the vibration of our communion. We are called the Malakim, and we will bring teachers to you. I thought I was going mad. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I'd already seen many, many different things, but you know, that doesn't mean to say that there isn't healthy skepticism <laughs> within one. Wow, this is extraordinary. And then, of course, the signs, the symbols, and the synchronicity would happen because suddenly I would meet a Native American teacher when I was vacationing in New Mexico, or I would meet a Sufi master on the path. You know, when the student is ready, the masters come. So I learned a tremendous amount about the angelic, the, the angelic communion and what they were trying to communicate to us about love being the, the essential principle, that feeling is the language of the soul. And so I'm really a self-made individual in the sense that I just keep moving with creation and tr I try to be absolutely present in the moment to the greatest level of authenticity, which is, of course, love. That's, that's well, first of all, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you sharing this story. It's my so pleasure. My it's pleasure. encouragement for many people. And um, I know that many, many viewers will have some their own experiences with angelic fields. And they can relate to it also. Maybe someone even had experience with your 12 archangels there, 12 well, many, pe many people are coming to me and talking about a council of light. Yeah. There are 12 beings. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You see, the, the angels of Atlantis are very ancient. They're called the Malakim in Kabbalah. And the Malakim mean the royal angels. They overlight the 12 Malkaizedek. Malkaizedek means priest kings, priest queens. This is the council of light. This is the intergalactic council. This is the great white brotherhood or sisterhood. And there are, principally, there are 12 beings of light. Yeshua is there, Mary is there, Buddha is there, Saint Germain is there, Kathumi is there, Omori is there, Lady Portia is there, etc., etc., etc. So they, the, the angels always come at times of great renaissance, these particular angels. And of course, this, as we know, they say this is the third great time of angelology, the third great wave of angelology since the beginning of creation. We are living in the most incredible times for the humankind. However, they are challenging. It's as Abraham Hicks, one of my favorite um, teachers years ago, I used to listen a lot to them and work to, went to the workshops and I did uh, many, many other work, but 
as they always say that uh, we are on the leading edge and we we are truly if we go with a stream like you are going with your stream i was listening to you and i'm like Stuart is going with a stream from place to place from person to person and i really immensely appreciate your time today and our conversation um, I have a feeling that my audience will request me to talk to you again <laughs> because they are very evolved, very spiritual, and they absolutely stand for the truth. They stand for love. They stand for high vibrations, and they love Diana. So it's a combination. <laughs> well, Diana is really here this time, as we notice. You know, mm -hmm. even though she's been dead for 24 years, her spirit is here. She is an angel of vast luminosity in the pantheon of the divine feminine. Um, and so we're going to see more and more and more. And of course, the wonder is that Harry is, um, is echoing his mother's energy in his own spirit and is the voice of liberation. And I mean, I, you know, I'm immensely proud of Harry. I think he's an extraordinary young man who is going to be doing some amazing things. I was so impressed by watching the Apple TV series with Oprah. Beautiful, beautiful. So he's carrying also the illumination of Diana's spirit with him. And, um, you know, this the, the work that I'm doing in relation to Di Diana is, this is not just through books. This is going to be a, a, a project called the Diana Heart Path, which I write about in the book where there will be workshops, seminars, conferences created all over the world, where people meet under the auspices of our love for Diana. And of course, we will be taught by living humans, not just Diana, but living human beings who are particularly the, the great women of the world, because after all, the women are really aroused, you know. And there's an old Japanese proverb that says, when the women's voices are aroused, the mountains move. Oh, I love that. And I so this, you know, this is going to be one of the banner headlines of the Diana Heart Path. And I'm hoping that, you know, by the time that we resolve our COVID process, <laughs> which gradually is being re resolved, that at the beginning of next year, or maybe in the fall of next year, there will be a leading conference in New York City. Okay. And uh, Anya, you will be invited. Thank you so much. I'm actually, I might be, before that, I might be in UK. Uh -huh. so, uh -huh. yeah. Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm based between London and New York. I just happen to be in UK at the moment because the doors are closed still for uh, non-essential travellers. I'm called non-essential. <laughs> we need travel to... is very essential. It's we one will, of the we, most... We yeah. That. yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually for me personally, if I can just say a little bit here, the, the travel aspect was one of the most challenging that was suppressed because getting to, to move to different energy fields, to different locations, to explore, to meet new beings, new people, to, to have interactions and different um, stimulations, it's very, very important. And yeah, it's very important. And that has been suppressed. And this is one of the hardest things. And yeah. it's going to go away. It's just going to take a little bit more time. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave you because I have to meet someone. Exactly. I was just looking at the time. Stuart, thank you so much for today. I very much okay. appreciate. Everyone, links are down below. So if you want to find Stuart, um, his work, his book, Diana, The Voice of Change, everything is down below. Thank you so much again for watching. Wonderful.